Good day, everybody, and uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm John Dernbach, and I direct the Environmental Law and Sustainability Center at uh, Widener University Commonwealth Law School. This is the <clears throat> 13th year of our Distinguished Environmental Speaker Series. We've made a point of inviting highly qualified speakers from a variety of backgrounds and perspectives. We've also made a point of giving our speakers the opportunity to reach beyond the academy and into the broader community, which is why we're doing today's program on Zoom. Today's speaker is Daniel Esty. He is the Hill House professor at Yale University uh, and director of the Yale Center for the en Environmental Law and Public Policy and co-director of the Yale Initiative on Sustainable Finance. Professor Esty is currently on public service leave and working at the World Trade Organization in Geneva on sustainability issues. And he's speaking today from Geneva. Uh, Professor Esty is the author or editor of 12 books and dozens of articles on environmental regulation, regulatory reform, energy policy, and sustainability metrics, and their connections to corporate strategy, competitive trade, and economic success. From 2011 <clears throat> to early 2014, Professor Esty served as Commissioner of Connecticut's Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. His policy innovations include the launch of Connecticut's first in the nation Green Bank to promote clean energy using limited public funding to leverage private capital. Prior to taking his Yale professorship in 1994, he served in a variety of senior positions at the US EPA. Uh, he received his law degree from Yale, a bachelor's degree from Harvard, and a master's degree from Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. And, and I like this, he was captain of the university ice hockey team. Uh, his presentation today is toward a sustainable global trading system, legal challenges, and environmental imperatives. As the world community ramps up its response to climate change and demands for a more sustainable future, interest in the international trade regime as a point of leverage for transformative change has grown. Um, at the same time, and there's been a lot of news about this lately, various climate change policy approaches including the European Union's carbon border adjustment mechanism and the green industrial policy reflected in the um, Inflation Reduction Act have been called out for their potential violations of trade rules. So Professor Esty will assess the opportunities and challenges that arise in trying to better align the trading system with climate action and the sustainability imperative of the 21st century. Uh, two housekeeping items before we begin. Uh, first, if you want CLE credit for this program, uh, please see the link um, <clears throat> in the evaluation form that will be put in the chat feature. I think it's actually already in the chat feature. You have to fill out the evaluation in order to get credit. And then second, there will be time for questions uh, at the end of the presentation. If you have questions, please put them in the chat, or if you prefer, you can ask him directly when the presentation is over. So uh, please welcome Professor Esty. John, thank you very much. It's um, a pleasure to be with you, uh, virtually, of course. Uh, and thanks to all of you for taking time out of your busy days and busy lives to be part of today's program. And I do look forward to moving from my lecture to uh, a conversation. So please do uh, think about questions, push back, uh, uh, or further refinements you'd like me to offer. I am going to um, build on some of my current work at the World Trade Organization, uh, where, as you heard, I'm on public service leave, having been asked by the relatively new Director General of the WTO last year, uh, a Nigerian woman named Ngozi Okonjo-Iweala, to come and help her and her team think about how to bring sustainability into the trading system and better align, in particular, the rules and procedures of the WTO with the world community's commitment to climate change action. So that really is the backdrop to uh, what I wanna talk about today. Uh, I'm gonna talk in three uh, segments. Uh, first about this, what I call sustainability imperative that I think has now come to dominate um, uh, life in the 21st century, requiring a number of institutions, organizations, businesses, and others to rethink their game plan, or in the case of business, their business model. And I wanna talk about how that sustainability imperative is in my mind, uh, re-gearing how the trading system needs to work, presenting some very substantial legal questions and legal 
potential, but also legal challenges. And then I want to close with a, a uh, uh, having looked at the sustainability imperative first, the impacts on the trading system and the legal challenges it presents second. I'll close with some reflections on the political realities of trying to reform the trading system and the obstacles to WTO reform that I think have to be overcome. So let me start, if I can, um, just to, by saying that this uh, lecture builds not only on my current work at the WTO, but frankly on my 30 years uh, of thinking about these issues going back to my time in the late 1980s, early 1990s, uh, when I worked at the US Environmental Protection Agency. And during that time, I was um, <clears throat> part of the team that negotiated the 1992 Framework Convention on Climate Change. <clears throat> and uh, it was also during that period that the US announced that it would engage with Canada and Mexico on a free trade agreement that became the NAFTA. And all of that uh, experience in government led me when I came out of government in 1993 to go to a think tank, the Peterson Institute for International Economics, and do a book on trade and the environment uh, called Greening the Gap. That book in 1994 was seen as quite jarring to people, um, but it has, I think, come ever more towards the center of the debate. And I wanna talk a little bit about that as well. So I do wanna uh, say a special thanks to John um, uh, for not only hosting today, but for his ongoing and in inspiring work on sustainability and how to drive sustainability into law and how to have law advance sustainability as an agenda. And that really is in the backdrop of this entire lecture. And I think um, uh, to some degree, the work that John and I have done together on things like America's Zero Carbon Action Plan, which we produced with colleagues from the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, are providing some of the roadmap for how society can undertake the kind of transformational change that's required. And by the way, I think in the chat uh, will be links to some of the things I'm mentioning, that, that Zero Carbon Action Plan, uh, the Greening the Gap book, and as I go along, I may make other references that in our Zoom world, um, I find are most easily chased down if they're put in the chat. So you'll find them there. So I want to start with a reflection. 30 something years ago, 30 and a bit uh, years ago, in the spring of 1992, I was at the US EPA getting ready to uh, go to the Rio Earth Summit. Some of you will recall was in June of that year. And I was part of the negotiating team uh, through that spring that was finalizing the uh, agreement that became the 1992 UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And I remember having a visit to the EPA uh, from the Secretary General of that Rio conference, a Canadian businessman diplomat named Morris Strong. And as we are waiting to visit with my boss, Bill Riley, the head of the EPA, Morris Strong said to me something um, that I remember being struck by at the time and ever more so over time. He said to me, he said, Dan, when we gather in Rio in just a couple of months uh, with thousands of government leaders, a uh, hundred plus presidents and prime ministers, in fact, that Rio conference at the time was the largest gathering ever of presidents and prime ministers. He said, when we gather all these political leaders, their cabinets, uh, thousands of media people and 10,000 plus NGOs, he said, you have to recall or remember or reflect on the fact that only two outcomes are possible, success and real success. And I realized uh, quite quickly what he meant, that uh, political leaders, whenever they gather, declare success. The question is, what's the follow through? Does one really have the legal and institutional follow through the transformative change to make things really move forward in a different way. And I think the reality is um, that years after that 1992 framework convention uh, was signed in Rio, ratified by the way, quite quickly by the requisite number of countries, including the United States, which some people don't realize, um, but it did not deliver on the promise of that 1992 moment. Uh, we did not get the true institutional change required, the legal change required, to really move us from a fossil fuel world to a clean energy future. And I think in the intervening years, uh, that reality has become ever more clear. And that what we saw 
in uh, 2015 with the Paris Climate Change Agreement was a recognition that we had to shift gears and do something different. And I wanna just reflect for a moment on that emerging reality that we needed to do more to address the sustainability imperative, as I call it. And for those who are interested, that's the title of an article I did in 2010 in the Harvard Business Review. So for anyone who wants more depth on that concept, there's where to look. But I think what we saw was that the world community recognized that there was some fundamental flaws in the uh, Paris uh, or in the original 1992 framework convention, uh, even more magnified in the 1997 Kyoto Protocol that the US never did sign on to. It had to be fixed in 2015. And let me quickly just uh, highlight these design flaws that had to be legally changed, legally revised. So the Paris Agreement most notably um, addressed the fundamental flaw, the I think absolutely uh, devastating uh, design defect of that 1992 agreement, but really even more so the Kyoto Protocol of 97, which divided the world into two groups, an Annex I list of countries, 40 something in number, that took on real obligations to reduce emissions. The original target of the framework convention being to reduce emissions in the year 2000. Actually, I'll be more precise, given that we have the lawyers in the room, to aim to reduce emissions in the year 2000 to 1990 levels. Uh, reiterated in the Kyoto Protocol with more specific targets. Uh, but it turned out that we did not deliver uh, because while the countries that took on obligations struggled at first, ultimately a lot of them did level their emissions. But the 150 other nations in the world who were invited to sit on the sidelines, in effect, did and did far too little. And it's that gap between developed and developing roughly, but that Annex One list of countries and all others, that really became a source of enormous political tension. And this is where the legal and the political intersect. Um, with some countries having obligations and others not, we began to face a problem that we're now undoing of having greenhouse gas emissions intensive activities shift from the countries that are regulated to the countries that were relatively at the time unregulated and, and still relatively unregulated. That concept sometimes called carbon leakage um, is a, a real concern because it means that the countries taking action may not really be reducing emissions, but rather just shifting them to other places. And that carbon leakage is only part of the problem. It's obviously an environmental issue, but it also presents a competitiveness question. If the countries that are producing under greenhouse gas emissions constraints bear costs for doing so, the companies will have a harder time bringing their products to the marketplace, particularly the international traded marketplace, at prices that are as competitive as someone who's producing in a country where there is no greenhouse gas emissions constraint. So that's become a fundamental issue that is what's now in, uh, in discussion. Now, I do think the Paris Agreement uh, fixed that problem to some extent by saying we're no longer going to have an Annex I list and an everybody else list. We're going to ask everybody to produce a nationally determined contribution to climate change action. And that, again, has become a term of art. You'll hear NDCs talked about all the time. Um, and what it basically says is every country should announce its target and how it's going to achieve its own strategy of emissions reduction. And I do think this is a big step forward because it's gotten everyone into the game. Everyone's now on the field uh, of climate change action. A second thing the Paris Agreement did was to move from a very top down approach to climate change strategy to a much more bottom up implementation effort recognizing targets are set by national governments in these big agreements, but we now call upon many more players to get on a field of action. So we now have governors and mayors, so states, cities, uh, and businesses all being called upon to step up and do things with some considerable value and effect. Uh, California, as I think many of you will know, is phasing out internal combustion cars by 2035. New York State is committed to a vast amount of offshore wind power that could dramatically change uh, the electric structure of uh, the Northeast of the United States. Connecticut, as you heard from John, launched a green bank. Uh, all of these things represent the kind of laboratory of the states where creative ideas can be tested out and then moved to the national scale. In fact, that Connecticut Green Bank is now part of, uh, at least the idea of a green bank is now embedded in the Inflation Reduction Act. So a great example 
of a state initiative becoming a national agenda item over time. Now, I guess there's one third design defect or issue that I think was addressed not so much in Paris, but in the more recent COP26 in 2021 in uh, Glasgow. And that Glasgow Climate Pact that came out of the negotiations that year does set a net zero greenhouse gas emissions target by mid-century, uh, interpreted by most as 2050. And that, I think, has really started to drive the belief that the world is changing, that we're going to move from uh, a fossil fuel world to a beyond fossil fuel world. And I think the real pressure there is interestingly not come from the translation of that commitment of the nations to a net zero target uh, into law or regulation, although it has been in some places, not so much in the United States, but yet the business community has really stepped up to this commitment and is starting to see itself as obligated as well to move towards net zero emissions. Uh, and some have committed to standards and timetables much faster than the governments by 2030 or 2040. Uh, but we're seeing lots and lots of companies make net zero pledges. The other big thing that emerged in Glasgow was uh, the finance world stepping up to the challenge with the uh, launch of something called the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, organized by the former Bank of England Governor Mark Carney, who got 430 something banks and financial institutions to say that they would over time align their lending with this net zero target. So I think what we see is um, a soft target of the past becoming a harder target uh, in terms of emissions reduction. Companies having started to think about this some years ago are now getting very serious about the transformation required of their business models. And I think you really do see the world now moving uh, towards a changed future. Now it's still in my mind, not very much regulation that's driving this. So it's not law in the traditional sense, but there are other points of leverage backed by law to some extent. For example, I think a big driver of this change now is corporate sustainability and companies saying that they want to go green. And that is reinforced by a growing pressure for companies to report on their sustainability across something called environment, social and governance factors or ESG reporting. And that has a second dimension to it, which is that a growing number of sustainability minded investors are saying that they want better alignment between their portfolios and their values. And they want their investment advisors to check out the companies they hold shares in and see how they're doing in terms of ESG performance. So we have a business community and now a finance community and an investment world all beginning to align with this target of reduced emissions. And I think companies are also realizing, and this is uh, arguments that I've developed over my research on corporate sustainability over many years, including my uh, book of a, a decade and a half ago called Green to Gold and the sequel that came out to that, the Green to Gold Business Playbook, which really laid out um, an argument as to why companies would wanna bring a focus on sustainability into strategy, take seriously this sustainability imperative. And it's not only because their, uh, their investors are interested, in many cases, their customers are interested, both business purchasers and the public, uh, in many cases, the your employees care. In fact, uh, what's driven action in a number of the big tech companies em is employees saying we need to do better. So all of this, I think, has started to really make it hard for companies to stand pat, and we're starting to see real action. And again, I think investors have been critical. And for those interested in more detail on that, uh, my recent book with uh, my Yale School of Management colleague, Todd Court, called Values at Work, sustainable investing and ESG reporting can give you a deeper dive into some of those uh, elements. Finally, I do think youth have been a bit major force here. Uh, young people are bringing a lot of energy to this conversation, really, I think, uh, pushing and beginning to make politically salient, more so in some places outside the United States, but emerging in the United States, uh, a sense that sustainability is a core value of the 21st century and needs to be taken more seriously. And that really brings me to sharpen the focus now on the topic of the day. I think the trading system has emerged, the world of international commerce has emerged as another critical point of leverage to drive uh, action on climate change specifically, but more broadly a push towards a sustainable future. And I think what it turns out is that the 
global agreement on tariffs and trade that's the underlying rule book that is part of the trading system now embedded in the World Trade Organization or WTO sets the ground rules of global commerce and in doing so could become a real pressure point on companies to do better uh, on greenhouse gas emissions, specifically on other aspects of sustainability more broadly. And I think for those of you who followed uh, the recent round of climate change negotiations, the COP27 summit that took place in November in Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt, you will know that there were a couple of critical elements that came forward uh, out of those negotiations. And it was notable, despite the fact the world had moved a long way from Glasgow a year earlier with a war uh, in Ukraine, the invasion by Russia, the economic isolation of Russia, uh, the resulting energy crisis globally that's turned into a fertilizer crisis, which in some places has become a food crisis, uh, all of which has driven inflation and become a uh, home budget crisis. All of that you could have imagined would lead countries to pull back on their Glasgow commitment, but it did not. Uh, in fact, the remarkable thing in Sharm el Sheikh was that the governments came and said, we're going to do more, and companies by the thousands were present at that gathering again, signaling to the world about how they were gonna to move towards more sustainable business models, how they were transitioning away from fossil fuels. So I think we now do have fundamental change appearing. I think we're seeing clear signals uh, of this sustainability imperative becoming a foundational element of business life and broader life in the 21st century. Now, I do wanna say that in uh, 1994, when I wrote Greening the GATT, I made a case, um, and the soft version of the argument was that you needed to take um, environment issues on board in trade policy, uh, or else you wouldn't get uh, optimal outcomes from trade. Uh, you might, in fact, um, end up with um, the gains from trade being undermined by losses on the environment side, by uninternalized externalities. Now, I think the original argument uh, of why we needed global trade, particularly coming after World War II, the Bretton Woods agreements, was the idea that we needed countries to pull together economically, to have a shared sense of economic potential and future as uh, a way to avoid having more wars. Uh, again, the Bretton Woods agreement, of course, comes on the heels of World War II and a, a first half of the 20th century that was uh, dominated by not just that war, but World War I and, and other conflicts. So there was a whole theory called du commerce, uh, in French meaning sweet commerce, and the idea being that countries that were economically cooperating were much less likely to go to war and fight. Now that theory has taken some hits, most recently by uh, Vladimir Putin, who's uh, really demonstrated that you can be economically irrational and go to war in ways that would make no sense if you cared about trade. But I think what we're really seeing is that there is um, a logic to keeping a trading system alive not only for purposes of knitting the world together economically, but because it's important to have a trade system that can help deliver non-trade goals, including climate change uh, and sustainability more broadly. So I think when I first wrote Greening the GATT, uh, there was a sense that the trade world was the dominant argument. It was critical to this theory of the world being knit together by economics. And I was told you need to kind of fit your environmental argument under the imperative. Uh, of an open trading system, of, of liberalized trade across the world. I think today um, the hard version of my argument has actually come true, which is that the imperative is environmental, it's sustainability, and it's now the trading system that has to be revised to accommodate this imperative of taking action on the existential threat of climate change and addressing the broader set of sustainability challenges from uh, waste and the need for uh, more care with a circular economy, uh, to what we do about plastics, to water, local air pollution, a whole series of sustainability concerns. So what does this mean? Uh, I think legally it means that the WTO is going to have to evolve. I think it's going to have to bring uh, forward a new sense of purpose and vision and direction. I think the underlying theory of the trading system is going to have to be refined. And I think the rules and procedures of how trade plays out in practice uh, are going to need some uh, rethinking. So let me walk through uh, kind of my vision, my agenda 
for um, a reinvigorated trading system built on new underpinnings with sustainability laid in at the foundation. And uh, here's what I would say. Uh, for a long time, the trade world has said to the environmental community, we don't get in your way. We're just doing trade stuff. Uh, we'll get out of your way if you want to advance an environmental agenda. I think today that attitude is not seen as sufficient. Getting out of the way is not enough. People today want the trade system to align with and reinforce the world community's commitment to climate change action and these other sustainability uh, goals, and not simply to get out of the way. And so that is really requiring this fundamental rethinking. I also think that the economic model on which the trade system was based, uh, which came after, again, World War II, and I would call it uh, at that time a soft neoliberalism, a theory that uh, market economies trading together, working together, creating this shared sense of potential prosperity uh, would uplift everyone. And people like Cordell Hull, who set this system up after World War II, the great American diplomat, and in fact won the Nobel Peace Prize for this knitting of the world together with the Bretton Woods system, I very much believed it was not just about advantaging America or other big trading nations like Britain uh, or the Netherlands or, or Canada or Australia. It was about lifting everyone and pulling people together. And I think that vision, which I call soft neoliberalism, uh, prevailed for some decades. But somewhere along the way, I attribute it roughly to the Reagan-Thatcher era, uh, we moved towards a hard neoliberalism, to what some would call a market fundamentalism. And um, I think in that regard, uh, attention shifted from this lifting everyone towards creating uh, a global commerce space uh, safe for big business, in particular, multinational corporations. And I think um, that uh, kind of priority of the trading system is now under deep question and even attack. Uh, and I think it's led to the trading system falling out of favor in the United States, where we now have uh, a Republican Party that used to be pro-trade, now largely anti-trade, a Democratic Party that has long had questions about whether trade served the needs of workers and farmers and small business people. Uh, now even stronger in those questions. And I do think um, one of the fundamental goals for the trading system is to be seen as people focused, not big business focused, and really taking seriously questions around whether uh, international trade is structured in a way that is gonna help uh, not just consumers, but workers, small business people, farmers, and others who may have been in the past neglected. I think more fundamentally, there's also a question of whether the trading system does collateral damage uh, to the environment, to nature. Uh, is it putting greenhouse gas emissions in the air that are gonna lead to climate change? Is it using water in unsustainable ways? Is it damaging biodiversity? And all of those questions, I think, are now front and center and need to be taken much more seriously by those in uh, leadership positions in the trade world, those who are doing the framing of potential refinement for this trading system. So I think what we need is a number of things, and I want to walk through that. For those of you who may know something about the trade system, uh, uh, you will know that the fundamental principle is one of non-discrimination. You must treat imported goods the same as you treat your domestic goods. And there are some exceptions to that, and most notably, Article 20 of the Global Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the GATT, says that you can uh, deviate from that principle if you have a good environmental reason for doing so. But I've been arguing, and I think it's now becoming well accepted, that environment by exception isn't good enough for the 21st century. We need a, a trade system that is much more uh, committed at the core to protecting environmental values and promoting a sustainable future. So I uh, uh, do think, and uh, John uh, Dernbach in introducing me already mentioned, that there's some real controversies emerging, some legal challenges that the trade system's gonna need to sort out. And the fundamental one that I think deserves some attention here today is the growing belief that you should not be able to get competitive advantage in the global marketplace by shirking on environmental obligations, uh, including the commitment to address climate change. And that any business that is out in the marketplace with lower costs than the competition because they are not bearing costs for addressing sustainability obligations, notably climate change, uh, is probably doing something that should be addressed. 
And this is at the core of the European Union's focus on doing something called border carbon adjustment, where they want to ask the question, is uh, are imports coming into the European Union produced in a place that doesn't have the same commitment uh, in particular to greenhouse gas emissions control, to climate change action? And if that is judged to be the case, then they are going to do a calculation of what the carbon price is in the European Union, what the carbon price is, the greenhouse gas emissions price in the exporting country, and then they're going to impose a special tariff equal to the difference to extract from that company that's producing elsewhere and sending their products into the European Union, the economic advantage that was obtained by not having a commitment to take climate change seriously. So the European Union has produced something it calls the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, or CBAM, C-B-A-M is the acronym. And um, it has become very controversial. In fact, for those, again, who are interested in uh, the details, I have a, a piece about to be published in the Arizona Law Review that uh, lays out my criteria for evaluating border carbon adjustment mechanisms. And uh, in brief, uh, and for those who want the details, it's in the chat, this uh, Arizona Law Review piece. Um, I, I want to ask the following questions. Is the structure being deployed environmentally effective? Does it actually help reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Is it administratively workable? Can those who are being asked to comply make sense of it? Is it WTO compatible? That is to say, not disrupting trade in gratuitous ways. And is it finally politically advisable? Are you bringing people toward the common commitment to greenhouse gas emissions reduction? Or are you making it more difficult for people to join uh, in the global commitment to climate change and uh, to climate change action in particular to reducing greenhouse gas emissions? Now, I think to the European Union's credit, they're pushing the issue by advancing a strategy of border carbon adjustment. Again, their version being this CBAM. Uh, they're doing it to reinforce their own carbon price signal. And they do have a carbon charge in place in the European Union that has fluctuated over time, but is something now close to $100 per ton of greenhouse gas emissions released. So a serious incentive to move away from uh, carbon intensive production activities and carbon intensive products to ones that are uh, cleaner and greener, more sustainable and with less damaging effect when it comes to climate change. So the problem I think is that the European Union approach is very unilateral. They're putting it forward and saying, this is what we're doing without really working with others. Uh, and the, here's what happens. They, they're gonna set a price. Again, it's the European Union carbon price. They're gonna decide how much credit the exporting country gets for their climate change activity. And oh, by the way, if it's not explicitly in a carbon price, you're not going to get any credit at all, which of course will make a problem for the United States, as I'll discuss in a minute. They then are using their own protocols to estimate how much in the way of greenhouse gases uh, emissions are embedded in the products coming in, all three of those being things they could do in a negotiated way with others, but instead are imposing their strategy. And then they're going to extract this special border carbon adjustment tariff. Uh, and at least uh, up till very recently, we're proposing to keep that money. In the last couple of weeks, they've suggested that they want to set up a social fund that might help uh, return some of that money to the countries from whom it's been extracted to help those exporting nations achieve higher environmental standards, invest in greenhouse gas emissions reductions. So I think the WTO is going to be where this all gets sorted out because there will be cases brought as soon as someone is hit with these special tariffs from the European Union. Now, the tariffs are still a couple of years away. We're in the build-up phase and initially are going to only focus on five industries. But the fact that they're coming is really driving people now uh, within the trade world to get very serious about border carbon adjustment and about how more broadly we're going to integrate into the trade system all of these different climate change approaches that countries are pursuing uh, varying widely across the world. And let's turn just briefly to the second big case study, which is the United States. Uh, and many of you will know that the US has systematically been unable to put a price on greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, in uh, the Obama era, there was a big effort to put forward uh, a cap and trade system that would be a system of emissions allowances, tradable, but effectively requiring anyone who is emitting in uh, certain sectors 
to uh, get a permit, uh, an allowance for those greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, while that legislation cleared the House, it never even got a vote in the Senate. In fact, it was never close to being able to pass the Senate and died. Uh, likewise, by the way, there had been in the Clinton era an attempt to put uh, some taxes in place, gas taxes, for example, that would help to start to create an incentive to steer away from uh, fossil fuel consumption. Uh, that effort also failed. So the Biden administration struggled, as we all know, uh, until this past summer with trying to put forward a climate change strategy uh, and eventually came up with uh, what is now called the Inflation Reduction Act. And that is, uh, I'm sure all of you know, uh, is not centered on any kind of uh, carbon pricing. Uh, it is focused on what a lot of people would describe as industrial policy, huge subsidies uh, to the tune of $370 billion uh, for clean technology uh, across a wide range of sectors. So really trying to create a very different pathway to a sustainable future. And um, many people would say um, this is a example of the theory of the second best. The first best option of pricing greenhouse gases unable to move forward politically in the United States, better to have the United States do something, uh, including this subsidy-centered strategy. Now, I think it's uh, a challenge because all of those subsidies run hard against the WTO principles uh, of not having domestic subsidies. Now, there's some question the U.S. may extend access to these subsidies to its close-in trade partners. They've already been extended to Mexico and Canada. Uh, European Union saying, well, give us access to the same thing and then it's all okay. Uh, but there is a current domestic content requirement in addition to all these subsidies that has got a lot of people worried about whether there's a violation of trade principles, trade law. My own view is that we're going to have to do more in the trade system to accommodate divergent climate change strategies. And the term of art that's being thrown around in Geneva is we need more policy space to accept a diversity of legal approaches to climate change. Now, I would argue that there needs to be a broader legal reframing and refining of how the trade system works. I think we're going to need to do more in terms of uh, future trade agreements uh, with sustainability impact statements. We're going to need to gauge whether the countries that are coming together to work out a more open market system whether they can find ways to mitigate environmental harms that might emerge as a result of expanded trade. I think for sure we're going to need what's called a green box for environment friendly subsidies, which is to say if your subsidy is for fossil fuels, it's a negative, it's an incentive to consume something harmful, we should be getting rid of it. If your subsidy is for clean energy, it's a very different story and there needs to be some policy acceptance of that within the trade system. I think we're going to need to strengthen this Article 20 that I mentioned, which is the environmental exception you're allowed to claim, uh, and give a wider scope to when that can be deployed. Now, we want to be sure that it's not abused, so I would argue you need to demonstrate that your policy that is perceived to be discriminatory, needing to be uh, accepted by exception under Article 20, is environmentally effective, because not everything claimed to be actually is that it's not a disguised barrier to trade, not disguised protectionism, and that the environmental gain is much bigger than the trade loss. We want to have some principle of proportionality. And I think there's conversations underway to try to make this happen. One other thing that I would just mention in passing is that the, the uh, WTO dispute settlement process has been very badly damaged by the United States failing to agree to the appointment of new judges for the appellate body, the review board within the WTO. So we now have a, a dispute settlement structure that is dysfunctional. And I think it is actually pretty disgraceful that the United States, beginning in the Obama administration with some pushback, the Trump administration outright refusing to agree to new judges being appointed. And frankly, now the, the Biden administration, having not done much to fix this, uh, is really responsible for the deterioration of a fundamental principle of the rule of law within the WTO. And I do think that needs to be put back on track. Finally, I think the WTO is gonna be under pressure to legally uh, begin to pursue fossil fuel subsidies and perhaps to do something else, which is to take down tariffs across the board on clean technology to help move those technologies that will help us deeply decarbonize across the world at speed and scale.
But the big new challenge for the WTO, in my mind, is to help set standards for uh, how climate change strategies and policies are going to be made interoperable. And I think in particular, we would benefit as a global community in having protocols to gauge the embedded greenhouse gases in traded goods so that we don't have the European Union deciding on its own, but rather have a, a structure that's agreed upon rules. Ultimately, I think we would do uh, very well to have an agreed upon social world or global cost of carbon. So we have an agreed upon uh, measure of the damage from greenhouse gas emissions, agreed upon approach to measuring those emissions that are causing harm. And with that framework in place, one can apply different strategies and approaches, but have a degree of integration possible. Now, my last point, my final segment of this, uh, is that all of this reform and legal refinement is going to be challenging uh, because of, of uh, current challenges uh, in the political domain, starting with a deep political dysfunction in the United States that you all are familiar with, I don't have to talk about, uh, but it makes it almost impossible for the U.S. to play a leadership role on any of this. Second, there is an ongoing north-south divide, developed versus developing countries, with a lot of the developing world saying, well, we didn't cause this problem. Our emissions have been tiny compared to yours. Why are we bearing such high costs for fixing it? And again, I think that's going to require some refinement um, with uh, significant new funds being made available to help those developing countries uh, acquire the technologies they need to be competitive in the 21st century on a sustainable basis. I think it's going to require uh, potentially rechartering of the World Bank and the other multilateral development banks. We've got an opportunity for leadership at the World Bank with the uh, director having resigned uh, just uh, a couple of weeks ago. So we do have new leadership coming there that may lead to this. But I think fundamental questions of fairness are hard to get over because of the deep differences in what that means. Now, I do think the progress uh, in Sharm El Sheikh in getting a loss and damage provision uh, agreed upon, at least in principle, was very helpful. By the way, for those who are looking at this from a legal lens, it was very important that there was a shift from loss and damage being understood as a liability concept that might allow for challenges uh, to those that have put the emissions in the air to an insurance concept where a pot of money is going to be set aside to allow those that are affected by harms from climate change, uh, perhaps as Pakistan was with the terrible floods this past summer, to have a pool of resources to go to to help rebuild. I also do think we're going to need to see much more private capital move uh, to address climate change. So green banks, green bonds, uh, and commitments from uh, the finance world to really be a source of capital at great scale, the scale required to move us to uh, the transformed future that's, that's necessary. Now, I would say um, a couple of other things. One, I think the political challenge is made more difficult by a lot of mistrust mistrust uh, of the United States and its motives, particularly in the wake of the Trump era, uh, mistrust of the European Union because of their unilateral push to create this CBAM, Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. But a lot of distrust even more broadly, distrust of China by many countries, not only the United States. So there's a lot of difficulty to be overcome in pulling people together. And yet success on climate change, as we all know, fundamentally requires everyone to be on board, pulling in the same direction. Now, I think there's a further challenge I just want to mention briefly, and then we'll turn to questions. And that is that there's procedural complexity to the way things get done at the WTO. Uh, there's a longstanding tradition that the uh, organization is member driven. 164 countries are members, and it's supposed to be they, the members, the national governments that drive the agenda, not the secretariat. But it's challenging because it's often the case that the members can't agree and can't get anything done. So I do think a, a more empowered secretariat may be necessary. A second, there is a long tradition of complete consensus, meaning every one of 164 have to agree before an agenda item could be put on the table, uh, before a budget can be approved. And that view of consensus, which is uh, contrary to what I teach my students, is dysfunctional. Uh, consensus, I say to my students, means most people mostly agree, and the biggest players uh, agree even more so. Um, but it can't be that every little country can object and break the system down. Another element uh, that I think is, is clear is that the WTO's tradition is one of zero-sum bargaining, uh, what's sometimes called tit-for-tat negotiation, where you give something to me, I give something to you. 
Uh, and that is a, a challenging, it, it works when it's about tariffs. You take down your tariffs on wheat, I'll take down mine on cars. Uh, it doesn't work when you're talking about climate change or the sustainability agenda. Uh, in this case, waiting to be paid off to join the effort to address climate change is ridiculous. In fact, many of the developing countries that are thinking they've got leverage here uh, are the ones that are most likely to be affected by climate change. So again, I think the trading system is going to have to re-gear with new approaches to how it does business, new ways to negotiate um, that are going to be more consistent with what's required to make progress on sustainability. So I want to close with one big idea. Um, I think uh, the entire trading system could be refined piece by piece and even sector by sector, and that may be what has to happen. But there is one potential way that this all could be done much more quickly, and that would be for the trade system to adopt by reference what I think is the transition from the 20th century to the 21st century in business ethics. I think the purpose of a company was for many, many years taught uh, all over the world in management schools uh, according to the Friedman Doctrine, named after Milton Friedman, the famous University of Chicago economist, who argued that the purpose of a company should be to maximize returns for the owners of the company, sometimes called the shareholder primacy theory. And Friedman argued that companies should push that up to the point of outright illegality. I think people have recognized that the law is porous. The law is a net. It's not a wall. And therefore, there was a lot of push into zones that seemed improper, but not illegal. So I think there's been a, a widespread recognition that shareholder primacy is no longer an acceptable ethical foundation for business. We now have to focus on, and this is something the Business Roundtable in the US has said, uh, a stakeholder responsibility model. And in a number of places around the world, I think that's taken root. Uh, in some places, even legally so. The European Union, for example, uh, now has in place a corporate duty of care that has changed uh, attitudes because it's changed the law. And companies now have obligations towards their employees, their customers, uh, the society broadly, communities they operate in. And I think if we had that principle adopted at the WTO, uh, frankly, uh, translated simply into the idea that there should be no business model that depends for its profitability on spilling harms on others. Uh, from an economics point of view, a no uninternalized externalities rule would be transformative. And using the existing structure of the WTO that has limits on subsidies, you could say that any spillover of harm is an, is an implicit subsidy and should be subject to what are known as countervailing duties, the way subsidies broadly are treated at the WTO to take away the advantage of that improper subsidy in this case, the improper externality. And I think that could actually, using the existing structure of the gap, the existing procedures that are in place, allow the trading system to become much more aligned with what's required to deliver action on climate change, a sustainable future more broadly, and perhaps deliver the real success that uh, Morris Strong was hoping for uh, in 1992. With that, let me say thank you. Uh, I'm uh, eager to connect with all of you. For those interested in this no externalities argument, I think in the, uh, in the chat is my end externalities manifesto with my colleague, Don Elliott, uh, published in the NYU Journal of Environmental Law, and uh, also a piece I've done uh, in a uh, European review called RED, R-E-D, uh, that makes an even more elaborate case about this transformed foundation for business as a critical pathway to a sustainable future. So um, I'll pause and invite questions, comments, thoughts, pushback. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dan. That was um, quite a lot to think about and um, quite a lot of ground that got covered. Um, I'm looking for questions in the chat and uh, you can certainly put them there. I'm not seeing any at the moment. Well, I see one from Irma. Um, who's... Oh, well, you're ahead of me then, go ahead. Um, all right. It, oh, no, she's just asking where these citations are. Um, so I guess that's not really a substantive question. We'll have to. Uh, uh, the, 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 all the sites are in the chat. So up, up higher, Irma, if you look up at the original part of the chat, you'll find it. But I, I and, and if you want, you can raise your electronic hand um, and we'll, we'll see that here on Zoom. So that would be the other way you could do that. Um, it looks like there might be a question. 
So here's a question, um, goes like this, CBAM will create serious challenges for developing countries, um, question mark, especially during the per peaking period and in the light of flexibility, in the light of flexibility in the Paris Agreement, more importantly, when sustainable development includes equity. Um, so I don't know that that's, I just read you everything. So well, maybe no, I'll just ask you. I'll take that as a question. Go um, ahead. Um, first, there is a lot of pushback on the European Union uh, with people saying, how does this square with the fundamental principle in the Paris Agreement that says um, the whole treaty should be structured around the principle of common but differentiated responsibility, um, which uh, expressly suggests that developing countries should be given um, standards or a break different from what the developing country, uh, developed countries are being called to do. Now, I, as I pointed out, think that they, a wide gap between expectations of developed versus developing was the cause of breakdown of the original 1992 agreement. So I um, have argued and I stand by the suggestion that if you look at common but differentiated responsibility and emphasize the differentiated, you're in trouble. If you emphasize the common with differentiated as a modifier of that, you can then imagine, for example, um, the possibility that countries all need to move towards a common greenhouse gas emissions price or equivalent policies over time, let's say by 2050, with some countries being expected to get to that top level of full net zero greenhouse gas emissions equivalent as a result of their policies uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, and perhaps you would allow more time for some countries to achieve uh, the full pricing structure required to get to net zero. So I do think having people all on the same target, but at different time frames, uh, would be a good thing to do. It's what was done in the Montreal Protocol, with countries being asked to phase out their ozone layer damaging chlorofluorocarbons, but the developing world being given 10 more years to achieve that phase out than the developed countries. So I do think equity is going to be a challenge, um, but I also think that there is a growing sense that we cannot allow uh, companies, never mind countries, but companies in particular, to get a competitive advantage by underperforming against uh, critical uh, environmental obligations, particularly the climate change commitments that have been made. And I do think the prospect that having very different expectations of developed versus developing countries is how you end up with this carbon leakage problem with uh, companies moving production to pollution havens and to competitive disadvantage, which is what the European Union is fighting back against. Well, thank you for that. Um, here's a question. Um, whoop. It sounds as though the interesting <clears throat> WTO quote unquote, no externalities concept would be the trade equivalent of a Pagovian tax approach. If so, how would you handle the valuation issues that have plagued Pagovian taxes? I guess it's Pagovian taxes anyway, or stated differently, how would you calculate countervailing duties? So Janet's raising a very um, important point. And um, so two, I have two answers to this. One, uh, it's a much better debate to have as to how to measure the harm uh, from an environmental spillover than uh, the wider debate that we're engaged in now. Second, uh, there is a well-established accounting structure within the trading system for how you measure uh, subsidies. And I think you can apply some of the same accounting principles, trade accounting principles, to the measurement of uh, spillovers of harm. And uh, again, well, one of the gains of the last 20 years is enormous amount of data on uh, how much pollution is being spilled, where it's going, who's affected, what the epidemiological effects are on humans, what the ecological effects are on ecosystems. So there's not to say it's easy, but uh, one can get reasonably good estimates. And I've always argued in, uh, in the world of environmental accounting that getting the numbers precisely right is not that important. If you are directionally correct, you're gonna create the incentives you need to really drive people towards more sustainable behavior. So I'm totally happy to get a first cut done uh, and over time refine it. And perhaps one can start with an assumption of how much harm is, uh, is being created and what people are gonna be charged in the way of a, uh, of a countervailing duty to take away whatever competitive advantage they're getting from spilling harm out onto society. And um, 
they can come back and argue and present facts that suggest they're being overcharged and perhaps it gets refined over time. Again, exactly what's done in the existing trade system when subsidies are being countervailed as it's described. So we've got now a bunch of questions in the chat and I'll just start with the, the earliest one. Uh, do you think a new organization other than the WTO should set international environmental baseline standards for the production of goods and services? This could lead to quicker adoption of environmental equity. So I'm very interested in where we can get standards set and how we get them set according to 21st century values, uh, including environmental justice or environmental equity. Um, having said that, I think the foundation of standards generally should be the best science and the best data and the best analysis. And um, I think that there are a lot of places to turn to for guidance on standards. The International Standards Organization, or ISO, uh, has got some work going. Uh, the WTO has got an ongoing conversation uh, on steel standards because the industry asked for that kind of a conversation with the hope that uh, there might be a way to come to a common protocol for measuring the greenhouse gases emitted in steel production. So I think there is, um, again, a, a good reason if we can narrow the debate to measuring embedded greenhouse gas emissions with an agreed upon price for whatever is agreed as, as occurring, uh, we'd have a much narrower uh, set of concerns to worry about in the trade system. So I think whether it's a new organization, whether it's accepting by reference information from uh, existing places of expertise, the ISO, or maybe the Food and Agriculture Organization on food issues. Uh, there's a lot of ways to get this data. And there's been a huge amount of analytic work done uh, in research centers, universities, think tanks on some of these issues. So I think we've got a pretty good base to build on. Um, question, is there any um, recognized model for a sustainable trading system? Um, other than the Greening the Gap book that I wrote in 1994, I would have to say no. Um, uh, no, all kidding aside, there is no one that set up a perfect model. There are a number of uh, sustainability provisions in trade agreements, including a number the U.S. has written. Uh, as some of you will know, the NAFTA provisions were rewritten uh, in the Trump era with the new Mexico-Canada-U.S. agreement. Uh, in my mind, the labor uh, teeth of the uh, new agreement is stronger than what was in NAFTA, but the environmental provisions have been weakened and opportunities to really modernize them were left behind, I think because the Trump administration did not prioritize this. Um, but I do think that there are um, a number of other agreements that um, could be pointed to, some of which the European Union's in, some of which the US has done with particular countries where there are elements that could be drawn upon. I happen to have believed that the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership that was negotiated near the end of the Obama administration and then dropped quickly by the Trump administration had a number of good environmental elements that would have been models, but there's no single model that I think we can point to. Uh, question here about um, <clears throat> the SDGs, and it goes like this. Sustainability has many aspects, while carbon slash climate is just one of many. Can you elaborate more on the other SDG related progress in global trades? Sure, there is, I think, a recognition that we wanna over time address not only greenhouse gases, but uh, water issues, waste issues, uh, moving towards a circular economy, uh, and even things that are in the social dimension of, uh, of sustainability. Are we um, alleviating poverty? Are we uh, addressing the need for clean energy for all? And I think the answer here is that the more we can measure progress on these different sustainable development goals, uh, the easier it's going to be to trace out whether the trade system is helping or hurting. Uh, in many regards, I think the trading system is how you disseminate best practices, at, including not just technologies, but funding for projects, fresh ideas, new thinking, better ways to create incentives. So all of that is a byproduct of an open trading system. Uh, and I do think there is growing evidence that when people are engaged in this kind of conversation, um, they're going to address not only climate change, but these other uh, sustainable development goals at the same time. So we'll take two more questions, and they're both in the chat. Can you provide some more insight on why countries like France are upset with the Inflation Reduction Act? So um, I think countries in the European Union broadly, France is a good example in particular, uh, believe the Inflation Reduction Act has two fundamental problems. 
One is it's centrally about subsidizing American companies to do clean approaches to problems. Uh, and that idea of subsidies has been contrary to historic trade practices. I myself think that um, what you're starting to see emerge is a lot of European companies bringing their efforts to the United States where they can get the subsidies if they set up a shop in the US. And the Europeans are starting to realize maybe they should match the subsidies rather than try to fight them. I think part of the reason why the US has moved to the subsidy approach is they realize they're competing with China that has been massively subsidizing clean technology for decades. And that's um, something the US has lost market share as, as a result of. So I think the subsidy piece is actually increasingly, maybe not in the French government, but in French business being seen as something that while traditionally not acceptable in the trade world may be given the existential threat of climate change needed to drive uh, the transformation to a clean energy future faster uh, and bigger. Uh, the second thing which they're even more upset about, and I think legitimately so, is that a number of these things are uh, subject to domestic content or domestic procurement requirements. So only US companies can get the benefit. I think if the US were saying anyone who comes to the US sets up shop, uh, gets you know jobs here, can get the subsidy, it'll be much easier. Uh, and I think there was particular chagrin in Europe, especially in France, that Mexico and Canada were drawn within the circle uh, of companies, uh, of countries and therefore companies that would get the benefit of the IRA while Europe was outside. So that still could be refined with negotiation over time. So last question. Uh, sometimes we see shareholder primacy as an enduring principle, but as you noted, it comes from mid-century changes from Milton Friedman and others. It seems to be a departure from earlier views of the corporation. Does it make sense to your um, view of prioritizing the environment as a reassertion of earlier concepts of the corporation as an entity with responsibility to shareholders, customers, employees, and society. Do you think reconnecting with your earlier approach is a way to answer or neutralize pushback against what some may call new restrictions on trade? Uh, the question clo closes, and I've gotten a number of these in the chat, uh, is a thanks for a great presentation, so. Well, thank you for the kind comments. Um, I think that my argument for a end to externalities as an acceptable business model is consistent with and highly aligned with um, the new, sort of new view of management having a stakeholder responsibility and a duty of care. Um, so I think I'm actually, again, not saying anything radical in the trade system, but simply adopting by reference what the business world has already put forward. By the way, if you don't like it as a business concept, and I'm presenting it somewhat as an economics concept, um, I would argue it's a medical concept, you know, a, uh, a do no harm principle. I think even beyond that, one could argue it's a fundamental principle in all of the world's major religions uh, where there's a duty not to harm people uh, as fundamental in almost every case. So I think there's a philosophical, spiritual, religious, economic, and business uh, backing for this as a core principle. And in that regard, I think it's not, uh, you know, it's not easy. I, I sometimes call it the simple solution. Of course, it's not simple at all. And as several people pointed out, it's got important and challenging implementation elements that have to be thought through. But I think if you can get, to get agreement on core principles, uh, the implementation challenges are, are fundamentally uh, easier to manage uh, than when you've got a complete uh, disagreement over how to even get started. Well, thank you so very much, Dan. This has been a, a great presentation. And um, um, I know it's the end of your day in Geneva, but I think we've all benefited from from um, your, your long, long experience and, and uh, um, all the thinking that you've done about this over the years. Good luck well, to you pleasure. and thanks again. Thank you. And thank you all for uh, staying with us through the conversation.